Hello. I don't think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, hello. Hey, Randy. Uh, uh. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, there we go. There we go. Now I can hear. <laughs> yeah, mine was delayed too. I had to press the audio button and put uh, connect via device. Yes. Yes, audio. Uh -huh. Huh. <laughs> yeah. That's what, yeah. Where are you at today? Uh, I'm currently going through Missouri. I'm on I-44 right now. Oh. I'm headed up to the good old state of New York. My husband's in Kentucky today. He said it was snowing up there this morning. Is it? Uh. it he said it's gone now, but it was snowing pretty good. <coughs> oh, damn. <laughs> are you nice and awake yet, Randy? What? I said, are you nice and awake? No, not really. <laughs> Why don't we ever? <laughs> <laughs> not really. I'm... I'm 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 struggling pretty hard with this new job. This uh, working nights. I, I didn't think it was going to be a big deal, and uh, I mean it's been because I've done nights before, but it's been quite a while. Did not realize it was going to be that much harder. Yeah, so. I used to I used to do security before I went and uh, did started my trucking school, and I did. Uh, nights on some occasions and days on some occasions and it was just real hard <clears throat> well i mean i worked i worked the i worked the overnight shift for like a decade but i haven't for the last two years and yeah. i was like oh yeah overnight it's not a big deal i did that for like 10 years man that was great it was easy and now i'm like oh i hate my life <laughs> oh yeah it's hard to get readjusted I did. Uh, I used to do factory work at the Whirlpool in Owasso, uh, and I was a fork truck driver, and yeah. I worked the night shift. And good God, it was awful. Uh, I, I ended up going and hiding in places and taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just driving around all night is really what I'm doing right now. So that's the hardest part. I mean, uh, what do you do? Uh, I, uh, I am a collateral relocation engineer. <laughs> that's a nice <laughs> way to say that, Randy. So you're a repo man. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> It took me a minute to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. But well, I'm not I, I'm not supposed to say like I haven't got into the truck yet, but we're working on that. But I I was told by one of the guys that I'm not supposed to say tow truck driver because tow truck drivers wear high vis gear, they're covered in dirt and they're stepping in mud and all that other stuff. So he yeah. said that you are a, you are you are a he, he said, you know, make it sound really professional. So, <laughs> lateral relocation engineer. So. That's excellent. Now, is that your own term, or is that a term he gave you? <laughs> no, actually, uh, the, the guy who got me the job is the one that gave me the term. But That's fantastic. <laughs> that, that is awesome. Yeah. I got my dog, Loki, with me. I don't know if you can see him back there in the bed. I kind of see him. Yeah. Yeah, he's my German Shepherd. Yeah. This is my first time taking him on the truck, so he's a little he's a little scared. Good morning, Mr. Brian. What's going on? How you doing today? Can you hear me? Morning, Brian. Yes, yeah. Can. Right. Don't be like me and forget to turn your audio on. <laughs> I think I got mine on. I think I'm good. 
All right. I'm going to check out back on the page, and I'm going to do that every once in a while and make sure nobody's having any problems with me, okay? I'll be back. All right, sounds good. I need to get something to drink. I can get ready. Well, wow, you really went far to get that drink. <laughs> When did we stop for the subway? Uh, Lutetia right. should be joining soon. No, I should be fine. Hey, Brian, real quick. Uh, you wouldn't happen to know of any places around Tulsa that I could... Uh, like rent a house from would you uh craigslist man craigslist is the best place to, but i don't know anybody personally but craigslist is where to go man there you okay go. hey hi hi that's my wife stephanie nice to meet you nice to meet you there's we a lot of seeing you when we were out there there's lots of people with houses for rent. Um, uh, how do we find ours? We, we draw a sign in the yard. Yeah, we drove around and found ours. We were the, we were the first person that uh, that called on this house, and that's how we got our house. We've been here three years now, but um, yeah. Uh, there, who who is it? Craigslist. Craigslist, man. Craigslist, the best place to look, man. There's always shit to rent on Craigslist. Or just go online and put a broken arrow. Google it. Hi, Chelsea. That's neat. What's it called? Zoom. And it's got. I'll have. So we got five people on there now. Okay. Let's see, I got Chelsea, Randy, Lane. There's there's. Hi, Chelsea. Chelsea. She's hiding, no video. I see that. She's maybe on the phone. There's Christine. Hi, Christine. How you doing? So we got all right. Somebody else from Oklahoma City. It must be Tony. Hello. That's so cool. Yeah, it is cool. So it's filling up pretty good. That's good, man. That's awesome. Yeah, we can get a little bit more people out when you're ready to start, Brian. We'll have them mute their audio. That'll be fine. Because I'm liable to go off on a tangent, but it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Not you. No, uh -uh, anybody but me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got birds. I do. <laughs> It's like Wild Kingdom at your house, Randy. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> okay, awesome. Good deal. Got you a Tweety Bird there. Oh, there we go. Hi, Christine. How you doing today? Wave. I can see you. I'm doing all right. I'm muting because my dog's been barking. The neighbor kids are outside playing. It's all right, man. I understand. I'm just glad to see you. Good Good glad to see you, too. Yeah, this is kind of cool. Is, uh, is that you, Tony, at 405? Well, I don't know who that is. All right. Oh, there's the chicken. All right. Hey, Leticia. She just woke up. She's trying to get her stuff together. I had to about me. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about me on my day off. Yeah. I didn't get it. I went, hey, we got up and went to the farmer's market, asparagus, and aloe vera plant. Got some. We started to dance a little bit because they were playing banjo and guitar, and it was awesome. It was a farmer sound. Like that. Okay. Hey, Hello. Good morning. That's Zoe. 
Good morning. <laughs> I hate morning. It's not morning, it's me. I think it's fine. <laughs> I'm with her. It's like second morning. <laughs> it's like round two. Well, I'm glad people showed up, man. This looks, this is awesome. This is, uh, this is fantastic. I'm, I'm glad I remembered that it was today. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I like to do this every Saturday. If noon works out for people, that'd be fantastic. <coughs> Well, I'm going to start, I'm going to start with just the gift beginning, right? We're going to start right at the beginning, and there's some important things that I think people miss when we start on this. Um, I'm going to start this week with a couple of paragraphs off of the beguiling of guilty, and then next week we'll go to the Volusia, then we'll come back, and we're going to go back and forth on it. But there's a, there's a pattern through all of this that I think, um, I think that a lot of people miss. And I don't think they do it on purpose. I think it's no one's ever said, hey, there's a there's a, a larger there's a pattern. There's a this weaving of thread, this weaving of weird through all of this. There's something there's something to all of it that has a much greater it's got a much greater idea to it than I think we give it credit for. And and that's um there's a reason there's a reason I want to start with it. And there's gonna be some people that don't like it, and that's fine. But the fact of the matter is, is that we've been doing this since Steve started this in 1972 or 68. We've been doing it this long. And every time we start doing something, somebody comes along out of left field or right field and they say, hey, but this person over here said this, this person over here said that. And we've got this foundation of ever shifting sand and it's screwing us. It's screwing us and it's allowing us, we're like a, a, a leaf or a feather on the wind. We're blown this way, we're blown that way. And all of a sudden we were distracted to the left and to the right. The very beginning of the, of the Prosetta points out how to stay focused. And people, people miss that for a lot of reasons. Um, if we cannot stay focused on the ideas of faith that our ancestors held, that allowed them to build great kingdoms and great civilizations and explore and go westward and have all of these things in a time where we have the free time that was once only the, the, uh, the realm of the royalty who had the free time to study and to read and they had their needs met. We live in a free country in a free time where we can take a look at all this. We have the time to consider these deeper esoteric ideas without getting too bent out of shape about it. We can go to the store and buy all the food we need to feast like a king. Um, and so far, the best we've been able to come up with are ideas that make us a target for other organizations or people who have nothing better to do than to screw with somebody saying, hey, I want to try a different way. And see, that's, that's entirely unacceptable. And when we get suckered to the left or to the right and get pulled off our path, we, uh, we fall right into their trap. See, there's, so I'm just going to start here with uh, the, the Gelfagening. Here begins the beguiling of Gilfi. So I'm going to read a lot of this some from straight from the Prosetta, and I'm going to offer my commentary on it. And I hope that when you hear what I'm saying, there's going to be some important things to consider here for us all to move forward. See, King Gilfi ruled the land that men now call Sweden. So here we have a king. Not a big deal. I mean, he's, he's however he's allowed, got himself to that point, he's at the top of the heap. Much like most of all, we, us are, in our own homes, we're at the top of the heap, right? It is told of him that he gave to a wandering woman in return for her merrymaking a plow land in his realm. Now, the woman is Gefian, but the wandering woman is, a lot of the time, Freya is the woman that wanders, searching for her lost husband, searching for that uh, masculine counterpart that, um, that seems to be missing in her life. But Gefian also has this, she controls the heavens for the virgins. The, woman, the women that die virgins, they go to Gefian. That is her, that's her safe harbor for those women that die with their virginity. So in both of those aspects, the goddess of Gefian and the goddess of Freya, we have this woman, this divine feminine, who is searching for a masculine counterpart, okay? 
So there's there's some interesting part just in that first sentence there, the first two sentences. And we always read through that and we look at it and it's like, well, this is silly. This is old, doesn't make any sense. But this woman, this woman was of the kin of the Aesir. She was named Gephia. She took from the north out of Jotunheim four oxen, which were the soils of a certain giant and herself, and set them before the plow. So she picked up four huge oxen, right? And the plow cut so wide and so deep that it loosened up the land and the oxen drew the land out onto the sea into the westward and stopped in a certain sound. There Gethkin set the land and gave it a name. She called it Sealand. And from that time on, the spot which the land had been torn up is water. It is now called the Lager in Sweden. And bays lie in that lake even as the headlands in Sealand. Thus says Bragi, the ancient scald. There's the poem there about how she took those four, those four oxen and plowed the land. There's statues of it all over Europe, you know, and I've seen many pictures of it. But what we need to look at there is this, this man, this king, <coughs> got suckered by a wandering woman, right? And she took from him all of his stuff. And I, I know a lot of men and women that have been divorced. And right there we have this man who just lost half his shit. And if you don't think that's relevant to today, you're high. That that right there, that man just lost half his stuff from this woman for merrymaking. So here he is. He's hanging out, acting cool. I'm the king. Let's hang out. Let's be cool. Bam, lost half his shit. So <laughs> that's still relevant today, although it comes in different terms. But the fact of the matter is there's a pain of loss involved in that. There's a pain of loss involved in that that most men do not have the tools necessary to deal with because all of a sudden he's a king, he's acting cool, and this woman just takes half his stuff. Now he is less masculine than he was before. And there's a real problem with that. There's a real problem in today's society of men seeking out women to confer masculinity upon them. And there's these women who are trying to find a masculine to let her know to allow these secrets of her heart, that she is beautiful enough, that she has beauty to share with the world. She's waiting on a man to allow that to happen. So they both suffer loss. She goes to Jotunheim to do this. She has to lower herself to take half this land for this night of merrymaking. She debases the beauty of who she is. And this king loses half of his stuff. This is the first paragraph of the prose edda. And when we look at that and we relate it to today's world, we find ourselves in very striking similar circumstances, men and women dealing with great pain and how they deal with that, how they recover from that it will, will largely determine whether or not we're going to be the wise kind of individual people love and look up to and respect and care for or whether we're going to be the bitter kind of people that find ourselves alone and angry. Right here, we have an answer. The man here, the king, he is prompted to make a search. Gephion, she marries another king, and they have children, and they populate the earth. So the seed of the divine comes not only from Rig, but it also comes from Gephion through these royal houses throughout Europe. Much of our ancestry can, can be traced back to it. So there's a double whammy of divine uh, blood getting into these royal houses of Europe. Gethin is one. She marries another king and sets up a kingdom, and they have children. She finally finds a place where she is allowed to express the beauty of who and what she is. And her children create royal houses across Europe. That's the standard interpretation. The king, on the other hand, is just a man. King Gilfie was a wise man and skilled in magic. So he's an accomplished individual. It's like many successful business owners of today. They feel like they're on top of the world. And I've seen it happen a number of times with these people I do business with. I did it. Get to doing pretty good, making a lot of money. I'm on top of the world. I feel good about everything. Hey, this is great. Next thing you know, some young girl comes along. There's a night of merrymaking. Bam, lost half my shit. What happened here? I used to be relevant in the world of business. Now, all of a sudden, all of this stuff that I knew and, and understood and allowed me to be successful in the world, now all of a sudden it counts for shit. Now all of a sudden it's not relevant. Now all of a sudden it's not important anymore. I used to be relevant in the world of business. What happened? How did this happen? What? So King Gilpie's much in that much of a state of mind, like many men who come into Ossetru. There has been something that drove them to come find this path. 
Many women are the same way. There was something, some idea of beauty brought them to this path. Someplace safe where they might be allowed to express who and what they are. And we get in here and all of a sudden we find something else. This is going to be an effort to correct that. He was much troubled that the Aesir people were so cunning that all things went according to their will. That's a powerful statement there. He was so cunning that all things went according to their will. He pondered whether this might proceed from their own nature or whether the divine powers which they worshipped might ordain such things. Let's think about that for just a second. And that two sentences right there, there's an interesting thing. This King Gelfi just lost everything he had because some woman took it from him, but she was of the Aesir. Okay, how does that, how does that relate to today? Let's take a good look at it. We have, I don't know how many people will point out where the Muslims are bad, how they do this or how they do that. They'll point out that the, the Jews are actually running the world or that this group over here or this group over here or Black Lives Matter or Antifa, all of these people are out to get it. Um, King Gelfi was a wise man. He sought them out. He went to find out. He went to take notes and see what's going on. We're still sitting here pointing out the fact that it's happening. That's not the actions of the course of a wise man. He pondered whether this might proceed from their own nature or whether the divine powers which they worshiped might ordain such things. So he set out on his way to Asgard, going secretly and clad himself in the likeness of an old man with which he dissembled. But the Aesir were wiser in the matter, having second sight, and they saw his journeying before ever he came and prepared against him deceptions of the eye. Isn't that kind of where we're at as all of us are true? We're still looking for that kind of answer, and we keep seeing these deceptions of the eye that pull us to the left or pull us to the right, and we get focused on this idea over here or this idea over here, and we need to hate that group, and we need to hate that group, and we, well, we can't really do business with that group because blah, blah, blah. When are we going to take a good look at how they're achieving that success and begin to incorporate it into our own world? Because we're, we're being suckered by those deceptions of the eye just like King Gilfi was, again and again and again. When he came into the town, he saw there a hall so high that he could not easily make out the top of it. Its thatching was laid with golden shields after the fashion of a single shingled roof. So also says Theodor of Vivine that Valhalla was that thatched with shields. So he saw Valhalla, he saw the warrior's heaven. On their backs they lit beams, sore battered with stones, Odin's hall, shingles, the shrewd seafarers. All those brave and wandering men that died on foreign shores have that place to go. <laughs> when he gets here, it's the same thing as what we're facing now. In the hall doorway, Gilfi saw a man juggling with anlaces, anlaces, having seven in the air at one time. Juggling seven knives at a time is quite a bedazzling sight. It's the kind of thing you could really focus on, isn't it? to juggle seven knives in the air at a time. It takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of effort to draw someone's attention to the juggling of these anlaces while they do something else over here. Only the mind of a man who is prepared to look past that and not fall for the sleight of hand is going to see past that, but there's more. This man asked of his name, he called himself Gangleri and said he had come by the paths of the serpent. Not a straight path, it was a winding path, one that went left and right, one that curved around and took the easiest route, right? The serpent always takes the easiest route, just like the rivers and the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he prayed for lodging for the night, asking, who owns the hall? The other replied that it was their king, and I will attend thee to see him. Then shalt thou thyself ask him concerning his name, and the man wheeled about before him into the hall, and he went after and straightway the door closed itself on his heels. When we show up in these areas, it's very difficult for us to go back the way we came. Every now and again, I'll see people that decide they wanna go back to being Christianity, but not for the most part. For the most part, that door is closed. That door, the idea that someone else is going to take care of our life for us is no longer a relevant idea. It's not something we're going to subject ourselves to. 
we have suffered under the lash of somebody else, some, some government, some church, some individual we're married to, and that door is closed. We probably will not go past. We have no choice but to go forward. But it takes wisdom to go forward. And as this King Gilfie is going forward, there are other things to distract him. Then he saw a great room and much people. We come here, we saw a lot of people. At first we see the games, then we see the drinking. Hey, we're having a good time. Looks like it might be a lot of merrymaking, a lot of fun. Some had weapons and were fighting. Now it gets a little more serious. Now there's a threat or a hint of danger in what we're doing that this might not necessarily be for everyone. But I found myself here, now what do I do? He looked about him and thought unbelievable many things which he saw. And we do see incredible things. We come into these rooms and these groups and we sit around these fires and we hear wonderful stories. We hear tales of survival of people that have made it through some of the toughest times in their lives. People that have been through things that most people will only ever see in a movie. And then we hear these woo factor things of sitting there on a the couch drinking with good buddy Thor or God saved me from committing suicide or the tales that I have heard sitting around these fires, the woo factor, as Joe Rogan calls it. I wonder often how many, uh, what's it going to hurt you to accept that woo factor? What do you lose if you decide to say, yeah, I believe that you believe that. It's okay. What do you lose? Do you get distracted by it? Well, you can't do that. I couldn't see it. So why, why would you be able to understand and see that? I don't understand what cedar is. Well, how can you understand what cedar is? Uh, we can go to a ruin. I don't, I don't get all that. That's, that's, that's utter nonsense. <clears throat> In some aspects, when we see people get distracted by those ideas of the esoteric, they are in no uncertain terms looking for that shortcut because they are bedazzled with all of the things that are going on around them and cannot find that thing to help them alleviate the pain or the need for love or fellowship or the things that brought them into this faith to begin with. So we seek a shortcut. We've tried to find a path. We continue to try to follow that path of the serpent, but that door is shut. We don't get to go back that way. Now we are in a divine aspect of who we are. Now we are on a path that opens doors for us that we cannot begin to imagine what might be behind them. <laughs> he said, all the gateway ere one goes out, should one scan, for tis uncertain where sit the unfriendly on the bench before thee. So the wise, the wisdom of King Gilfie understands immediately that all these things he sees may not necessarily be the best for him to get involved with. He understands that maybe I shouldn't really get involved in that. I don't need to go over there. I came here for a reason. I came here to move forward. I came here because I have a question and I'm going to get an answer. When we find ourselves up against, whenever the chaos at the edges of our mind begin to threaten to overwhelm our thought process, people will automatically fall upon those righteous, indignant and passionate ideas that have carried them through so many difficult times in the past. Whether or not it's really happening is irrelevant. The body doesn't know that what the mind is thinking isn't really happening. It floods the body with chemicals. There is an immediate biochemical response and we feel like we've made it through an area, but we have not garnered the wisdom of keeping our path one foot in front of the other. We've been distracted over here and automatically resist it and become its polar opposite and feed upon that energy and we lose sight of our path. And this is what's happening. And in the first two paragraphs of the Prosetta, we find written in there a warning of what exactly happens when people try to search out and find this ancient path. When we try to figure out, do these things go according to their nature of their being, or do they go according to the nature of the powers that they worship? Because that's very much where we are. Are we trying to determine if the nature of things are going to go according to our being? Or are they going to go according to the powers that we worship? 
There's an answer for that later on in this poetic and prose edit, and I will get to it. And it has a lot to do with the union of the heart and the mind. That idea of the union of the heart and mind is repeated almost as much as the idea of whether one can question and answer well. The man who cannot question and answer well is the one who finds someone to blame for the question he can't answer. Be it the Jew, the Muslim, the Democrats, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, what universalist, folkish, whatever it might be. The one who cannot question and answer well is the one who will find someone to blame and to hate. The wisdom of King Gilfie is he's going to ask that question to the very top dog. Right? <laughs> Gangleri began his questioning thus. This is the first one. Who is foremost or oldest of all the gods? Har answered. Har means high. He called in our speech all father, but in the elder Asgard, he had 12 names. So we're talking about a time before the elder Asgard. This is the Asgard of the golden age. This is the Asgard before the three all-powerful Jotun females entered Asgard. The horse thief, the, uh, the bewitching one, and the love of gold. Before those three ideas entered Asgard and brought about the downfall of the Golden Age, we had the Elder Asgard. This is the primal, very powerful beginning of it. He had 12 names. One is the Allfather. The second is Lord, or Lord of Hosts. The third is Nikar, or Spear Lord. The Spear Lord is a very ancient idea. If you're in Ice Age Europe, 16, 20,000 years ago, and you have a spear and you can kill a boar or you can kill a mammoth or some other gigantic animal and you have the best of all spears, you're going to be Lord because you're going to be able to provide for your village in ways that cannot, you can, we can't imagine a day. To have the abundance of a dead mammoth, an animal the size of an elephant with warm hide, powerful bones, tusks for, for crafting art, you're going to provide your village through a winter. And that's a very powerful thing. The way to kill a mammoth was with a spear. This is why Odin has hung near, right? <coughs> the fourth is Nikeder or striker. You gotta be able to defend your village. You gotta be able to defend. You have to be, one, you have to be willing to strike. The fifth is knower of many things. Pretty self-apparent, he sacrificed an eye. The sixth, the fulfiller of wishes. Well, that's something people don't want to talk about because that sounds too much like Christianity. Hey, is there a fulfiller of, you know, it's like sitting there, Janice Joplin saying, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? But yet we have here the fulfiller of wishes, the seven, the far speaking one. His voice, his words are going to carry through time, much like they're doing right now. The eighth, the shaker, or he that putteth the armies to flight. The ninth, burner, burner. Tenth, the destroyer. The eleventh, the protector. And the twelfth, gelding. All of those are very powerful aspects of what a king in your own home should be able to do. Right there is an outline of what you should be able to do as a king in your own home, as a leader of any sort whatsoever. You should know many things. You should be technically and tactically, technically and tactically competent in many things. The fulfiller of wishes. You have children that look up to you and respect and expect things. If you are a leader of any kind, people are going to ask for things. You need to be able to provide that knower of many things aspect of who you are. The far speaking one, providing that wisdom and guidance for grandchildren and children as they move forward to be able to tell them what might lie ahead, what difficulties they're gonna see. The shaker, you're going to shake things up and make sure that it's right in your home. He that put up the armies to flight, you've got to protect your home. Because while we are not designed most effectively or efficiently to resist all of these things that are facing us, that are, that are forcing us to feel defensive all the time, We've still got to be capable to do it because our children and our wives and our sisters and our mothers and our families of all things need to know that we can protect and defend them. The burner, burn those ideas out. That's the love of gold where he's burning gold vein. That is not Freya. Okay, the destroyer, the protector, the gelding. 
The gelding is loyalty. The gelding is loyalty to your spouse. Then ask Anglary, where is this God, or what power hath he, or what hath he wrought that is a glorious deed? Hor made answer, he lives throughout all ages and governs all realms and directs all things, great and small. Then said Hafnyar, now Har means high, Hafnyar means equally high, and 3D means third. So there's three aspects of the divine there. And that's a whole nother complicated subject. Dumazel, uh, wrote his uh, tripartite. It is something that is repeated in mythologies around the world, regardless of time, regardless of, a, of age. Uh, there will be a, a, a triumvirate of, de of deities. There will be three beings at the top of the heap. Odin represents all of them in this tale. Though in many other aspects, Dumazel tried to say that, well, there was the king priest, there was the warrior, and there was the regular man, and yet when you read through the Riggs Thula, it is a complete destruction of that idea of the levels of society, which is particularly pertinent today as Rig visits the great grandmother and grandfather, the grandmother and grandfather, and the mother and the father. And it may be a thousand years in between each visit, but each time he does, each time the divi divine is welcomed into that marriage and that union, the children do better. The children go and go one step further beyond their parents. And that that's a wonderful tale in its own, and we'll get to it. <laughs> the greatest of all this is that he made man and gave him the spirit, which shall live and never perish. Though the flesh frame rot to mold or burn to ashes, and all men shall live, such as are just in action, and be with himself in the place called Gimli. All right? But evil men shall go to hell. Hell is a very confusing goddess because people want to say, well, first he calls her hell, and then it says the place. Well, they do the same thing with Hades, and they do the same thing with the... With the uh, with the Slavic goddess. The god or goddess, the name of that god or goddess becomes the name of that place where the dead reside, the halls of the ancestor. People want to say, well, that's too Christianized. Well, let me tell you something. One of these ancient sets of tales came much earlier than the other. And whether or not we like it is irrelevant. It's what we have. This is what we have. The Germanization of early Christianity is a very important thing. That idea came from us, not from them. They see it, they, most people have it backwards. People want to decry that as soon as they see it. Well, that, that sounds too much like, don't we all want to go to the halls of our ancestors? Do you think we walk in there where like our bodies are still intact? No, we go in there with some other kind of aspect, with the spirit that was given to us at the, crea at the creation of man, ask and Emma. <coughs> Evil men go to hell and thence down to the misty hell. They go to the goddess, she sends them to the misty hell. That is down in the ninth world. The deceivers of men's wives, the breakers of oaths. Those are the men that are not, that are outlawed. Those are the men that are not, have not understood the lessons of the Lord to become valuable parts of their community. They are the ones that go down to be gnawed upon by Nidhogg. And people want to complain about that too. But hey, this may be, this is where Christianity got the idea, not the other way around. That's the ninth world. And most people miss that. What did he before heaven and earth were made? And Har answered, he was then with the rhyme giants. Okay, so he was with the rhyme giants. And that's an interesting thing because that's a primordial kind of uh, idea. Gangberry said, what was the beginning or how it began it or what was before it? Har answered, and it, as is told in the Voluspa, earth was the age when nothing was. Nor sand, nor sea, nor chilling stream waves. Earth was not found, nor ether heaven. A yawning gap, but grass was none. Then said Yafanhar equally high, it was many ages before the earth was shaped that the mist world was made, and midmost within it lies the well that is called Virgilmir, from which springs, thank you, from which springs the rivers. Now the rivers, and I can't even pronounce this shit. Now this is a part that bothers people. But there is a, and for a long time, I, I didn't understand it either, so it just started yeah, first was the world in the southern region. So we have fires called Moosebell. It is light and hot. That region is glowing and burning and impassable to such as our outlanders. If you're not from there, you ain't getting through it and have not their holdings there. He who sits there at the land's end to defend the land is called Surtur. He brandishes a flaming sword. And at the end of the world, he shall go forth and harry and overcome all the gods, burn all the world with fire, thus said in the Belusba. 
Sir fares forth from the south with switch eating flame. On his sword shimmers the war, the son of the war gods. The rock crags crash, the fiends are reeling, heroes tread hellway, and heaven is cloven. There's two things there. Now that passage from the Voluspa, I am firmly convinced, and I wrote about it in Life and the Love of Life. It's one of the passages that records in ancient history the meteor or the meteorite or the comet or whatever you want to call the damn thing that hit the Laurentide ice sheet and destroyed much of North America. Graham Hancock has written a wonderful book about it and it it talks about it. When the stars rain down from the heaven, everybody's dying because the heroes tread hellway, they're all dead. The sons of men on the march, these are the giant tidal waves that washed across the Oregon Scablands, New Mexico, that washed out of Lake Bonneville and created the Snake River Canyon that washed across North Dakota, that washed across Minnesota. These huge floods and the, the, um, the uh, Woods Hole Research Institute also has discovered that the same thing was happening on the north side of Canada as huge volumes of fresh water were washing into the Arctic Ocean. So it wasn't just coming south. It was going everywhere. They found a huge impact crater in Greenland. So all of this stuff kind of records that our ancestors may have witnessed this destructive event. It's recorded in the Voluspa, and we'll talk about it next week. But the, the creation idea of the rhyme that we talk about here, the streams called ice waves, those which were so long came from the fountainheads that the yeasty venom upon them had hardened like the slag that runs out of the fire. Okay? These then became ice, and when the ice halted and ceased to run, then it froze over above. But the drizzling rain that rose from the venom congealed rime, and the rime increased, frost over frost, each over the other, even unto Ganungagap, the yawning void. Then spoke third equally high, Ganungagap, which faced toward the northern quarter, became filled with heaviness, and masses of ice and rime, and from within drizzling rain and gust, the south part of the yawning void was lighted by those sparks and glowing masses which flew out of Muspelheim. So you have the the cold cerebral thought processes of the mind and the warm passionate ideas of the heart. We're talking of the individual. And when they come together, great things happen. And then third said, just as cold arose out of Niflheim and all terrible things, so also all that looked toward Muspelheim became hot and glowing, or passions. But Ganungagap was as mild as windless air, and when the breath of heat met the rhyme, so that it melted and dripped, life was quickened from the yeast drop by the power of that which sent the heat by the power of that which sent the heat and became a man's form. There is a scientist right now at MIT who has created a, a theory, a working theory. In the 1950s, a couple of scientists tried to figure out how life was created on Earth. So they combined all of the basic elements that were, that were present four and a half billion years ago, the primordial idea of methane, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, oxygen, all of these compounds and they put them in little beakers. And what they came up with was about 24 amino acids that were the building blocks of life, but no life. So the structure was there in the compound itself for life. The physicist at MIT came up with an idea. Organisms develop to dissipate the energy to which they are exposed to. So they tried it, it works. When an energy is exposed to a certain amount, when, a, when some element is exposed to a certain amount of energy, it changes, it develops, it becomes something more. So slime begins to absorb the sunlight and dissipate through chlorophyll and all these other actions, and they become, and it becomes life. Here you go. Thank you. That. That's how these things happen. This, this whole idea that this primordial substance, you shine a light on something long enough, some shit's gonna change. And that's basically what's happened here. The power of that which sent the heat, the star or whatever that sent the heat and it became a man's form. That little sentence right there corresponds exactly like this new theory from an, a physicist at MIT. Now all of a sudden, we have not one, but two ideas at the very beginning of this, of this lore that says, 
Our ancestors recorded a great event that has destroyed, we have 12,000 years of history on four and a half billion year old planet. What? <laughs> so we have our ancestors recording quite possibly one of the most dramatic events. I mean, you could not have survived that thing on North America. There were continent-wide wildfires. You have Surtur marching the scourge of branches. You have a continent-wide wildfire. Above every Salutrian uh, settlement, there is a thick, there's a black mat, and that is the ash from everything that burnt down. And when this meteor struck it through huge amounts of ejected into the atmosphere, ice and dirt and rain, and this is what filled up Lake Bonneville. This is what filled up the Veles Crater. This is what washed across Western North America and Northeast North America and created this huge destruction. So when the skies turned black, stars <clears throat> out from the heaven and Surtur marches across, there may have been some people on boats. They probably went somewhere and created Go Blecky Tepe and then Stonehenge. I mean, this is all this, but human beings have been on this planet for 150,000 years. People like you and I, that like us, as we know them, Homo sapiens. In that 150,000 years, we have 12,000 years of it barely understood. And it is more than likely that the nice, neat proto-Indo-European ideas that we all want to rest comfortably upon our laurels as if we understand are only partially correct. In that 150,000 years, those individuals will have wandered across the surface of this earth many times following the flows of life, following where the pastures turn green and where the animals are going to migrate. These great migrations that still occur today, people still follow these great migratory animals, the herds of caribou, the wildebeest, these all across uh, Mongolia, the great grasslands of the, great, of the central steppes, following them out as the Ice Age changed Northern Europe, mammoths, they went over to Siberia and then on into North America. People followed those animals. They followed the flows of life. But I digress, we'll get into that later. In this first little part of the Pro Prosetta, there's this amazing amount of information to the person that doesn't get distracted to the left or to the right. There's an amazing amount of focus, of science, of history, of wonderful things that will allow us to continue moving forward to ask the right question, to take the right note. Is it because of the nature of that people or is it because of the gods they worship? Is it because of the nature of who we are or is it because of the gods we worship that we're going to find success? One thing that it does tell us, we will not find success if we're sitting around waiting on the boogeyman Jew to jump out and take all our shit. It's not gonna give us any success if we're waiting on some terrorist from the Middle East to come blow up all our shit. Those things may be happening. We cannot afford, as we rebuild this new faith, to get distracted by that and use it to give us a sense of purpose and direction because it will not do it. It will stymie all of our growth. We will stop right there at that point. We will never find what we're looking for if we are waiting on certain conditions to be met that will allow us to become who we're supposed to become. Only when we find a pure blah, blah, blah. No, that's not when you're going to find it. When you're going to find it is when you can stop being distracted by what's going on over here or over here or what this person says is important and what that person says is important and begin to follow your heart and unite the passions of the heart with the thought process of the mind. Now all of a sudden things begin to go our way. Now all of a sudden life begins to change. Now all of a sudden the truly wonderful things that we thought we, ex we expected to happen when we came here begin to show up in our lives. That's what this is all about. I can get distracted and pick the low hanging fruit of all kinds of individuals. I can get people fired up over all kinds of, any, of, of political ideas, but what we cannot, what's that gonna do? Anytime you see masses of people, my chanting in the street, raising hell, giving off chaos and anger, where do you think all that energy is going? If we are to subscribe to the idea that the yeast drops quickened by the power which sent the heat. Where's all the energy we're giving off going? What is it doing? What is it creating? 
That's the real question. When we get tied up in that kind of nonsense and what we think we know about this kind of political ideology, and then we decide to give off all this anger, what are we creating? Is it something our children will be proud to have? Is it something our parents will be proud to know that we're following? Will they see wonderful things take charge in our life as we unite the heart with the mind? The whole idea of, of Odin <coughs> bringing in Njord, Frey, and Freya into the cerebral, high-minded sky gods of the Aesir, where you have Tyr and Thor and Sif and Odin and Frigga, when you bring in the treasures of the sea, when you bring in the abundance of life and the gentle spring rains, when you bring in love into that high, you create a balance that lasts the ages. No matter how anybody wants to look at it, a thousand years after it's been, they tried to tramp it out, that thought process, that idea, that notion, the hint of greatness that beats within our chests is still present in what Odin created at the end of that war. The only way he could do that was sacrificing the ego, which caused him to throw a stinking fit to begin the war that started it. We are in that same boat. Again and again, that union of the heart and mind is what helps us bring this faith into something that will allow us to achieve what we want to achieve. I think that's all I've got for today. But I'm glad that all of you joined me and I hope, and there's a lot of information in that. So you might have to watch it a couple of times. But thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it, Brown. Welcome, ma'am. I'm gonna do it next Saturday. We'll do the same thing next Saturday. We're gonna go over the Veluspa and there's just a world of information in that as well. It's every bit as deep. We've covered two big paragraphs of the Prosetta. Imagine the depths of what ghost is in the rest of it. No, I, I agree. It's all there, man. I, I think it's also worth of note, um, the, the Aryans, when they came over, they had two ways of classifying the divine feminine as a uh, horse goddess or a cow goddess, which definitely shows us that they feared the feminine energies and they had a way to basically sort out the productive and the chaotic. The uh, chaotic horse goddess would sit there and could make a man feel great, empowered, but destroy him just as easily. It's the cow goddess that nurtured and took care of the home and made the men aspire. So, I mean, it's, it's in the lore, it's in the history, it's in the culture. Yeah, we get into that a little bit later with the next when we talk about uh, Ar Argomir. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that nurturing aspect of the goddess and what it, act, and what it really means. And, and um, it'll continue to break down because there's a wonderful thing happening here. All of this stuff is creating, all of this, all of this energy is being expended to, to well, it's just being spent. It's just being energy pushes out and things respond to energy. Just like when you put something in the popcorn in the microwave, it begins to pop. And it's the same effect here with our lore is as it is exposed to ever greater, more dynamic aspects of energy, more and more wonderful things begin to unite until such time as Rig walks through the earth to kind of get us back on track. Notice that in our lore there's not a great destruction of because the gods are angry. What you get is this wise compassion that walks across the earth. And as the, as the wise couple accepts that divine energy into their home, they begin to enjoy success. There's, that's a wonderful, reassuring thing. I mean, and it can only come from the kind of verdant life-giving environment that Northern Europe was at the time, full of game, full of wild food, full of trees and lumber and shade and water and fish. And when you go to those great religions of the desert where you can literally die of heat standing in your front yard and you're at odds with the world that might destroy you just because you're in the wrong place or you're out of water, you really see the, the, the split in that dynamic when it's a destructive flood. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of history that goes with that too. Your Babylon and the Tigris and the Euphrates and the annual floods of the Nile. But in our environment, 
we live in a warm, verdant, life-giving environment where the gods are more than willing to know us, are more than willing to allow us a seat at the table. And that's, that's repeated as well at the Eager's Feast. Here you have this wise king that goes to seat at the table, and the only way he's going to get that seat at the table is if he doesn't get distracted by what's going on over here, over there. Like the roof guest. That's the important thing there. And that's, um, you know, there is I was going to say, another thing to point out as you uh, were talking about the energy exposure. Um, we all, microcosm, you know, macrocosm, you know, we all know what we put in our body is, has, has an impact. You know, you're taking that from the outside in, but the same thing, what we feed our minds as well. If you're just hooked up on a uh, anti-stance all the time, well, you're feeding off whatever you're against. That's going to have that's going to have some weight and some tear on the heart. And when yeah, it's gone, you've got that's, nothing. So that's if you what I'm to the divine instead, that's a right. limitless source of power that will empower you, make make life changing. Well, that's what I'm talking about. With when you get distracted by your passionate ideologies, your brain, your body doesn't know that what your brain is thinking isn't really happening. So it floods your body with those chemicals. And people, be, people get every bit as addicted to those angry ideas. Uh, people will think through something that happened 20 years ago and get every bit as mad as they were in that moment. And their body will be flooded with those chemicals. And sometimes they call it an emotional hangover. When you're done being angry, you're just kind of kicked back. But your body has fed off of those chemicals and literally gotten high off of it. Yeah. The great demon of today, the great dragon of today that people must slay, isn't a dragon of a physical nature. It's that dragon of our own thought process. This this drug addiction that runs rampant across our nation, methamphetamines, heroin, cocaine, all of these powerful drugs, these are the dragons that men must learn to slay. Yeah. And if they can't do it, they don't they stand at risk of losing half their shit. <laughs> I also, I also want to throw in there that uh, all those stress hormones and everything that you get from the anxiety, they're just like other drugs. It can cause wear and tear on the body, shorten your lifespan. It gets you addicted. And, you know, hell, look at somebody who just focuses on something that gets them angry all the time. You know, 20 looking like 30. It's, uh, you know, you're consuming all these energy and nutrients you take in and putting into something that's not building you up. I know you all about it. I look at that gray beard. Look at that <laughs> guy. Yeah, baby, I know all about it. Been there, done that. Yeah, I'm but especially. I I'm you, than you. you look good for 25, though, Brian. It's fine. All right. <laughs> okay, I got you, man. I'll just... Hey, I'm That's I'm gonna hard. get off here because <laughs> have to mow the lawn and all those under wonderful things that go with living in a nice home in Middle America. And it's a nice, <laughs> wonderful day here. I think it's gonna be like 77. Christine, I I don't know. It's probably still colder than shit up there, isn't it? So we're gonna we're gonna. I'm going to go enjoy a day, man. But it, I, I tell you, this is a fantastic way to start the day. And I thank all of you for coming in here and joining me. Well, thank you for taking the time to do it. Actually, it's pretty nice. To oh, good. It's going to have a good day today. Well, good. Yeah. Get Asa out there. The and see the over here in Springfield. And tell Asa I said hello. <laughs> I will do that. I'll try to get them on next week. Man, that'd be awesome. I would I'm really sure Alyssa was busy yelling at the kids or something. <laughs> okay, I, so I will be down there next week. So, Okay. These are videoed, you guys, too, and it'll be available for I you. I will be down there next week. Where at? I'll let them know that, too. Okay. I'll yeah. be out at Alyssa's and Asa's next week. So, so I will get them on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, get them on. Sound like a plan? Yeah, I'd love to see Asa, man. I, I saw the video of him standing up the other day, and it brought tears to my eyes. And uh, that's that is a wonderful. And I know, I know, guys. A lot of y'all don't know, but Asa, Christine has a son, Asa, who had a bad car wreck, caused a lot of a lot of damage to him, and he's in a wheelchair. But I saw him stand in a group of it brings me to tears right now. It was a group of uh, <laughs> individuals of heathens that were standing there. It was all head nurse. Yeah, yeah, and he, <laughs> he, he stood up yeah, out of his wheelchair. Goodness. He stood up out of his wheelchair to raise a horn, and it was just by was, himself. By himself, that's exactly right. And it was an amazing thing to witness. And I, more people yeah. see that. More people need to see what heathens are accomplishing. What osatures 
are beginning to see and feel and achieve that union of the heart and mind. And that's, hey, it's a wonderful thing. But I digress. Um, I'm going to get off here, guys. I appreciate your time. And I think, Melissa, <laughs> when it becomes a video, we're going to upload it on YouTube, right? Yeah. And I'll make sure that there's a link somewhere, <laughs> even probably on the event page, so you guys can find it. All right. Good deal, man. Because I, I know that the true good folk... Deal. I want to see the true full kindred on here too. And I know they're going to watch this later. That's a good group of people out there. So yeah, that's uh, All, right. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Y'all take care. Have a great Thank day. You, Brian. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You, Brian. Thank you, Brian. you be good, man. Thanks right. for this. Bob. You bet, man. Thank you guys. So Scarlett uh, said hello. Okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No facilities for me, but I could take him out. All right, folks, I'm hopping off of here as well. Later. Later, bud. You be safe. Don't get hurt doing the repo thing. <laughs> no, I won't. All right, bud. Later.